Alright. Hopefully this works. And hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing here. And, uh, it's a cover piece for US Assassin that is Slither, uh, created by Chase Poulton, which is Mark Poulton, the writer's son. Uh, that is Recoil, Bazooka Dog, which was something that Mark had brought up on Facebook. And I was like, we have to have Bazooka Dog. So uh, I got a little email saying, hey, I changed the script. Bazooka Dog's in. Uh, there's our witch. Um, this is our blind assassin. Um, this is a actual character design of one of my characters from the 90s. Um, his original name was... Uh, was Victor. Uh, that was his code name because he quote unquote never lost a fight. Um, so I decided to use his design. His design was doing nothing so I figured I would use him here. Um, and then that's our poor little USA Assassin's head right there. The hole blasted through the top. Not really giving anything away. Um, but uh, yeah. A little peek at some art. This is on uh, Kubert School art store boards. Strathmore 400. It's nice and thick board. It's it's durable. It reminds me of old image stock boards. Uh, but what I do use for everything else, that's pretty thick too. It's the Eon uh, high def boards. You can see the difference in color. Um, like this is bright, bright white and this is kind of an off almost yellowish um, but a lot of a lot of Strathmore does that um, I honestly don't know what kind of I know it's a Bristol board but I don't know where he gets it um, and uh, there's if you're looking for it eonprod.com uh, Brett is the owner and he is awesome I have been getting paper from him for 20 years now uh, off and on. So, uh, yeah, uh, this is just going to be my first video. I can't do any live streaming um, until I get a thousand subscribers thanks to uh, YouTube's new uh, new rules that kind of suck, but, you know, I can understand. I can understand. Um, so, I have an inked version of this. My friend Greg Paulson inked uh, a, a copy, a blue line copy of this. So uh, I'm trying to decide whether I want to just talk and ink this while I talk, or I might do a, another piece. I want to kind of do a homage cover. The uh, uh, I want to do one with uh, our bad guy Slither. And U.S. Assassin, and I kind of want to make it look like, um, I think it's Amazing Spider-Man 3, 16 or 17, the one where Venom is kind of on top of, uh, Spider-Man, and, uh, got all the rubble on the ground and speed lines, and, uh, I've been doing a lot of, um, homage covers, getting ready for um, some news coming hopefully soon um, for USA Assassin. Um, I'm hoping it's uh, sooner than later, but you never know. You just kind of, you know, life gives you what it gives you, and uh, you just kind of roll with it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the, uh, the homage cover. So I want to make sure I leave enough room at the top for a logo, if it's going to be a cover. If not, I'm going to put a little box there for whatever. Um, and then we got to put the little little box down here, the UPC box. I know Todd used to do a lot of little, little head drawings and the ones that weren't um, going to stores and whatnot. Uh, I believe those are the, I think those are the direct market ones. 
that didn't have the UPC code but still had the box, so he always used to draw on those. Um, so yeah, we're just going to uh, gonna do this little kind of homage piece. And we might not get it done in the time I have, but you know, maybe we'll just come back to it. So, if I remember correctly, Spidey's on his back. And he's kind of all... That was the great thing about Todd was he always... Like, nothing was just flat. Like, your a hand wasn't just a hand. It was, like, gnarled. And, you know, all the fingers were in different positions. And, and it created just, like, this field of depth. And, uh, and you know, made stuff look cool. And, and, and you listen to any video um, where they talk to Todd. And his biggest thing, and, and it's still to this day, is uh, he wants it to look cool. And, and that's really been kind of the crux of his success, in, in, in my opinion, um, is that he's just, he's stuck to that rule of, oops, I totally screwed that up, um, making it look cool. As long as it's cool, that uh, he's okay. I mean, I remember being a kid in a uh, Sorry if this jiggles a lot. My uh, camera holder is not really that great. Um, I don't have the uh, the nice rigs these other guys got. Um, but uh, I remember being in junior high and I'm trying to think of the first Spider-Man cover I Spider-Man book I got. Um, pretty sure it was. The one with him and um, oh, what was it? I'm pretty sure the first one I got was um, the one with uh, it might have been 317, where uh, Spidey's kind of in the middle of the cover and the symbiotes wrapping around him, and I saw that and I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And, uh, went to, there was not many comic shops back then. It was mostly, you got it from 7-Elevens and stuff like that. But, uh, we were lucky we had a, a couple. And right now we have, like, six, I think. One just closed, but, uh, it had been around for almost ten years. And it's really kind of, kind of odd to have that many comic shops, uh, in one kind of town area. But I'm getting off topic. Um... But yeah, I remember seeing that, and I was just like, that is, you know, because up to that point, I was like, oh yeah, John Romita Jr. is the best, the best artist I've ever seen. It was the first artist I ever took notice of, and, you know, the world he, he creates, uh, looks real, everything, you know, because before, a lot of early comics, at least for me, you know, they all had kind of like that faked Kirby background, where it just looked like a bunch of, like, they took a, a all the shapes off of like a circle template or something like that and just that's the background but like Ramita Jr. you know you, you were in New York you knew you were in New York and and uh you knew where you were at everything was was grounded in his style it didn't look out of place at all but then when Todd came along like it was just I don't know it was like uh like the first time you saw Star Wars cause you know, I, I, I grew up in the, uh, I was born in the 70s, and, um, you know, uh, I was the youngest. Um, my brother is eight years older than I am, so, you know, I kind of watched a lot of the stuff that my dad and him watched, and it was a lot of this old serialized stuff, but, you know, like Buster Crab, uh, Flash Gordons, um, there was a show called Saturday Matinee at the Bijou, uh, which showed old, you know, like the Cisco Kid and all the Zorro serials. So, you know, I was kind of like my introduction to, to sci-fi through that, which, you know, is kind of a weak introduction, really. Um, but then the first time you see Star Wars, it's like, you know, bam, you know, it's like, holy cow, I can't believe, you know, nobody's done this before. I can't believe that 
um, movies can be this exciting, you know, because before it was very much, you know, going to have a static camera that doesn't really move, and if it does, it's just going to go left or right, you know, you didn't really have a lot of cool cinematography, and, you know, uh, George Lucas is by no means, you know, uh, Spielberg, <laughs> but he got that energy and that excitement in in uh, that first Star Wars movie, and that's exactly what, like, Todd was. Todd was just, like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, it's like a cup of ice cold water splash on you when you're you're feeling tired. It just like woke up all your senses and and uh you know, made you go, Wow, there there's more than just this. There's possibilities. You can you can you yourself can bring something to, to art, you know. It doesn't have to be just what's come before. And uh yeah, I'm probably gonna go over this logo. Um, I like to draw big. I'm sure the cover is actually a lot smaller, but I'm just kind of going from from memory here. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean it it was so refreshing. And then you know you get into uh, I started going through my collection of comics, and I'd actually had some of his earlier stuff. I had a couple of uh, Infinity uh, comics that I had gotten for uh, a birthday present. They used to sell comics in like it looks like a short box, but they weren't didn't really have short boxes back then. Um, and it, you know you'd have like fifty or hundred comics in it or something like that, and just be all random. But I had that, and then a friend of mine had uh, Invasion. Um, from DC, and that was some of Todd's stuff, and I went back to that, and you can see, you know, the the beginning of, you know, his, his designiness, and his trying to, to bring more energy to a very static scene or situation, and, uh, but yeah, by the time he hit Spider-Man, I mean, I'd, I'd, I had never read any of his Hulk, I, uh, I was not really a big Hulk uh, Hulk guy growing up as a kid, I, I was all about Spider-Man, um, and, uh, yeah, so I unknowingly had some of his earlier stuff, and, um, and I just became rabid, I, I went, found as many back issues as I could, and, of course, you're not gonna get, you know, uh, even back then, you weren't gonna get a cheap copy of, uh, Amazing Spider-Man 300. Uh, that's something that still has kind of evaded uh, my collection. Uh, just because there's, I, I'm not gonna. I have four kids. Uh, I'm, I'm not dropping, you know, 150, 200 dollars on a on a comic book because uh, that's food in my kids in my kids' belly. So. Um, and I'll just switch this up a little bit. Um, but yeah, I just everything he did, I, I followed, and and when Image hit, all those guys were hot. Um, you know, I, I was one of those guys that got sucked into, uh, you know, Jim Lee, and uh, you know. But what's funny is, you know, so many people were like, "Oh, Jim Lee, Jim Lee, Jim Lee," but honestly, I thought Wills Portacio was. Uh, a much more interesting artist than than Jim was um, by a long shot. Jim's stuff was kind of, I mean, it had some action to it, but the uh, the art itself was kind of stiff. Um, and I know I'm I'm not Michelangelo by any any stretch of the imagination, but I just always thought that Wills kind of went under the the radar. I actually have you guys can find this. This is one of the first times I, I had been introduced to Will Spartacio's work. Legion of Night by Marvel. Um, I believe it was their epic line, maybe. Maybe not. But, I mean, just look at that. You know, this is 1991. You know, and this is just nuts. You know, it's just this creepy, creepy, 
You know, I mean, just look at, just somebody standing has such dynamism. And, you know, here's a background, background, but this is sparse. This lets you know this is an important focal point, you know. Same thing here, focal point. Um, and it was just, it was such a great book. Um, there's two parts to it. I have issue one around here somewhere, but, you know, like with everything in in my collection, it's buried somewhere. Um, but yeah, Wills to me was, you know, was, was in my mind better than Jim. Um, and then that also kind of led into, uh, meeting with Wills at conventions. He was always super nice. And the one time I met Jim, and I know everybody has great Jim Lee stories, but he was kind of a jerk to me. And, you know, it's that whole thing, you know, I, I've met Rumita Jr., super nice guy, I met him a couple times, um, never meet your heroes, uh, it just, it'll, it'll, it'll break your heart, and, uh, you know, I, I was a young kid, and I wanted to know if it, Image had just started, and, you know, you see all the people that are working for, like, Extreme, and you're like, oh, you know, you know, I, I, I could, you know, learn from, from those guys, because I, you know, I never ever thought I would be the same caliber as, you know, a, a Todd or a Jim or a Wills, but, you know, and I was just like, hey, uh, are there any editors here for imaging? He didn't even look up. He was too busy talking to some guy that was sitting next to him, and he was just like, I don't know, why don't you go ask him? And I'm just like, but I don't know who they are, and he's like, I don't care. And I was just like, wow. And then another one of my friends, uh, Jim was walking around, um, the convention, I understand, you know, those guys had a lot of responsibilities back then, they had a lot weighing on them, you know, um, but one of my friends, Art, just walked up to him while he was walking around, he's like, kid, I don't have time for you, and all he was just going to say was just like, hey man, I, I enjoy your stay, he wasn't going to be like, hey, can you sign all these comics, so it just kind of became this, you know, don't meet your heroes, and, um, you know, um, I kind of stick by that. I mean, I, I've kind of met the people I want to meet. Um, I, uh, I'm friends with the people that I want to be friends with. Um, you know, if I get new friends, that's, that's cool, but, um, I'm not going out of my way to be like, hey, uh, Todd McFarlane, we should be best friends. No, because I know that'll never happen. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm real good friends with Mark Poulton. We've him and and John Malin, um, who I've done, you know, the the new Indiegogo uh, Graveyard Shift Volume Two. I uh, did a twenty page story on that, um, and there were, um, excuse me. Um, they had a contest to have, you know, quote unquote amateurs, um, do some work for them. And it was paid, which was great. Cause that's a great opportunity, you know, to get, to do work that's going to get published. That's going to be guaranteed to be published and you get paid for it and, you know, get paid, you know, pretty much a professional wage. Uh, you know, that's pretty unheard of, you know, none of those, those image guys ever did that for anyone. Um, you know, you had to, to move to wherever they were and you had to be part of whatever posse they, they were and deal with whatever tantrums they threw. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, I've known those two guys. I've known a bunch, you know, I, I met a lot of people on the Rob Liefeld boards, which is funny because I, I really do not like Rob Liefeld. Um, I was a fan of his work. Uh, when I was younger and dumber and not really aware that, you know, he was kind of a, kind of a con man. Um, he stole his, all the stuff that he's famous for, he stole from other people. Like that, the cable cover with all the gunshot holes on it, that's an Avengers cover. He didn't come up with that. He stole that. He swiped it. Uh, there's a cover where 
Cable's holding a giant machine gun. He didn't come up with that. He stole that from uh, G.I. Joe. And, you know, the difference between me doing this and him doing that is I will put my name, you know, McMahon, and then I will put in after McFarlane. No, no, no. He, he made all that stuff seem like it was his. Like, oh, this is my original idea. No, it's not. Deadpool, that's Deathstroke. Deathstroke with a Spider-Man mask. You know, and yeah, it's popular, but it's popular because of other writers that came along and, and made him more than just a one-note character. And he's taken... Um, I, I hate to rant about a person, but, you know, he's taken so much credit for things that really aren't his. Like, you know, he, he one time... You just follow his Twitter account. The dude is... I'm surprised his ego can be contained on that. Um, He started talking about, like... He showed a picture of, like, police riot gear and was all proud that he's like, oh, yeah, you know, this came from me drawing cable with all this gear and all these pouches. And I'm like, are you, are you fucking high? You know, it just, uh, the ego on him, it just, and the fact that he ripped off people. Uh, I just, you know, he had a, he had a, a Kickstarter, uh, for Brigade, for Brigade, um, which, you know, at the time, I was like, yeah, uh-huh, I'm on board, I'm on board, you know. Um, I really like Marat Michaels, uh, who drew Brigade, Brigade back in the day. And, um, you know, Marat's given me some some indie work on for his company, Counterpoint Comics. Uh, Naughty and Nice, uh, I believe I did issue 8. Um, I think I did part of issue 0. I did a Halloween issue for, I think, 2017. And I did a couple of pinups, um, one for a lingerie issue and one for a uh, bikini issue. And then I did uh, Join Pain number three, I think it was, was the backup story. But, you know, he's he's always been super nice. And I just, you know, a lot of times you see these super nice guys and, you know, they're friends with these people that are just giant assholes. And you're just like, how? How can you be so nice and your best friend is this giant egomaniac? I just don't understand it, but... You know, different strokes for different folks, man. Um, but yeah, Rob, you know, he had this brigade um, Kickstarter, and I was like, oh, cool, maybe Marat will do some stuff. And uh, so I joined, and he said it would be out that fall, and that fall came and went. And then uh, the next fall came and went. And then the next fall came and went, and any time he would do like a couple updates a year, and it would be like, oh, my my phone was hacked, or oh, all my social media was hacked, or oh, this was hacked, that was hacked, and you know, I'm just like, okay, well that was hacked, but what about the book? What about the book? The book has nothing to do with your social media accounts being hacked. It has nothing to do with that. Um, you have physical art. You're the one that's drawing. You're the one that's putting it together. And then he kept throwing colorists under the bus. And then he'd always say, oh, you know, San Diego Con, I'm going to have it done. And then San Diego Con comes, and he's like, oh, I'm doing this new blood strike. You know, it's going to tie into Brigade, and oh, you guys got to get it. And and Brigade will come out after issue three of Blood Strike, and then Blood Strike number three I don't think ever came out. And um, just, you know, lie after lie after lie. Oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then he had the balls to put it up on Indiegogo this year. You know, this is the six-year anniversary of this Kickstarter, and he's just ripped people off left and right. He just doesn't care because he's Rob Liefeld. You know, I, I can guarantee you none of those other guys would have done that. None of the other image guys would have done that. So to me, after my long ramble that really has nothing to do with what we're talking about, um, yeah, I don't really like Rob Liefeld. <laughs> Uh, but I, 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 you know, I used to be a fan, and it's like it's that thing, you know. Don't don't meet your don't meet your heroes. Don't meet people that, you know, you put on a pedestal because they will let you down every single time, you know. And it was just through, you know, the only good thing that came out of being on the Liefeld boards was, you know, I. I got to know Marat Michaels and, and talk to him and do work for him. And I, I got to meet all these guys like John Malin and Mark Poulton. And, you know, that led to all three of us working on stuff. And, 
you know, I picked up John from, uh, in Ohio. He drove down from Michigan to Ohio. I picked him up in Ohio and we went to a Philadelphia con in 2011. We had a great time, you know, and, and, uh, you know, those guys are my friends. And, uh, Sean Arendt, who is, uh, probably one of the other guys that I met on the Lightfield boards. He's one of Mark's best friends. And, you know, he's my buddy, man. And, and it's all because of that board. And so I, you know, I, I'm ragging on Rob, but I, I hate to give him the credit that, you know, I've got these really great friendships because of him, you know, and really not because of him. It's because, you know, we clicked, but he gave us the forum to, to meet. So, I don't know, take it for what you want. I still think he's a dildo, but that's just me. Um, I know a lot of people are still like, ooh, sun rises and falls out of his ass. I'm like, all right. Uh, I'm not, I'm not part of that cult, sorry. Um, but yeah, I, uh, loyalty is a big thing. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys that's, you know, I don't want you to, like, throw your kid in the volcano for me. That's, that's not what I mean. But, uh, you know, you see something wrong that's going on wrong with, with one of your friends, you know, you let them know, and, and, you know, I've had some, some interactions with some people that, you know, were quote-unquote my friends, and have gone after those guys, and, and I've just been like, no, that's, that's not cool, and I let them know about it, and I let the other people, the people that were talking smack know, and I've basically said, ah, ain't gonna happen, uh, I'm not gonna let this slide, because these people are my friends. Friends are, you know, it's like family. You can, you don't have to be blood to be family. You don't have to be blood to be, you know, an important part of someone's life, you know. You get to choose that, you know, whether the universe chooses it for you. But, I mean, ultimately it's your choice. Uh, yeah, I really liked the community we were building with uh comics gate and uh you know i don't really know what's gonna happen uh i stay out of it um don't really like drama i think it's a waste of energy it's a waste of um waste of energy it's a waste of i don't know it's just it's just such a waste you know you know, these people are like, oh, I hate war campaign. Oh, I hate people who hate war campaign. Like, who fucking cares? You know? Like what you like. Do what you want. You know, as long as you're not hurting people. You know, if I want to like Cyberfrog, I'm going to like Cyberfrog. If I don't want to like Cyberfrog, I'm going to not like Cyberfrog. But, you know, that's that's about the extent of it for me. I don't... I don't go out of my way to to make people feel bad about stuff. I don't, you know, I'm interested in what people, new stuff people are looking at and, and new campaigns and stuff like that. That's the stuff I'm interested in. I want to see new, you know, see new, new creators, new art. And uh, that's the stuff that kind of gets me excited is, um, you know, it, being an artist now, being a creator now, uh, it... Like, I don't even really get... I don't get regular comics anymore. Like, I'll still get Spawn. But that's usually just because Todd does the cover, not because of whoever's doing the insides, because the insides usually don't look that great to me. Um, but uh, I don't really... I don't spend money. I haven't gotten mainstream comics since December or November of last year, I think. Uh, mainly what I've been doing is I'll either get back issues of stuff fill in some, some holes in my collection, or I'll get on somebody's uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter, and I'll get that stuff, because that stuff, you know, a lot of times, you know, some of the, the stuff that really appeals to me is stuff that is not by pros, is by, you know, new creators, new up-and-coming talents. Um, there's a guy I know, Bob Sally. Um, he 
has been doing for for a couple about five five years now I think um, this book called Salvagers and I saw it um, somebody else had posted the link to it and I picked it up and you know he was on it you know I mean you got your book you know when he said you were gonna get your book he you know would put in extras you know he would talk to, to, to people who are fans of the book the dude really appreciated every sale he made and that made me a fan seeing the artist that he would get to do stuff um, another one of the guys I met on Lifefield Boards Adelso Corona a uh, fantastic artist, but even in a more amazing inker. Um, he had drawn and inked some covers for, for the Salvager stuff, and that just even more enticed me to want to wanna, you know, get that project because one of my buddies was, was part of it now. Um, but yeah, it just seems to be... I can't, I can't resurrect that little kid in me that was excited to walk to a 7-Eleven with his 75 cents or his 65 cents to get the next issue of, you know, Secret Wars or Spider-Man or, or whatever. I just, I, he's just not there anymore. That kid doesn't exist. Um, but what's left is a guy that's excited to see new creators, to see what other people can come up with that's not the status quo, that's not... That's something new and fresh that will give you that energy, that, you know, that kind of kick like the first time you saw Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man. And you go, wow, I've never seen that before. That's really amazing. That really has me interested. Um, you know, going back to, to John, uh, Malin, and Mark... Um, I know on one of the... One, one YouTube show... Uh, um, John had said that I'm I'm the first Graveyard Shift fan, and that's, that's pretty true. I, I got to see, you know, me and me and John uh, at the time were sending email commerces to each other of of whatever what we were working on for Mark, and um, you know it was great. I got to see I got to see pages, and I got to see you know this new thing Graveyard Shift, and you know I was I was a little bit jealous because I was like, oh that's way cooler than what I'm working on <laughs> because the concept was just so, I mean, it sounds simple. What if the universal monsters were the X-Men and just those two, those two keywords, like the possibilities in your mind just go, Holy crap. Yes. This is awesome. This, why hasn't anybody done this before? Because nobody thought of it before Mark and John. And, uh, you know, I'm just, Every time John would get a new project, I'm like, so, how's Graveyard Shift? So, how's Graveyard Shift? And he'd be like, it's coming, it's coming. And luckily, uh, it finally came at a time when, you know, there was more than just me that was super ravenous for John's art and uh, the idea. And, I mean, proof is in the pudding, man. That Kickstarter's doing gang... Or the Indiegogo's doing gangbusters. Um, and I'm just... I'm very, very privilege to to be a part of that this one um i think it's great um i hope the work that i did is good enough uh but as an artist you are always second guessing yourself you're always hating the next the the last thing that you did um but i mean that's just that's just kind of how it goes that's life um Yeah, the community's great. Uh, you know, whether you want to call it comic skate or just, you know, people who want to change, um, you know, that community is, is great, I think, because everybody is kind of of that, you know, you can say it's SJWs or, or whatever, but I think, I think honestly what it is is that the industry has kind of become stale because of the lack of, um, you know, and I don't want to say it's like the image guy's faults, but I mean, kind of that revolution, I mean, it opened the doors for creators, which is great, but it also closed a lot of, um, 
ability for creators that work for big companies to kind of do kind of add their own flair to have long runs on a book uh, because these people don't want the creators to be more popular than the characters anymore and uh, they saw what happened they didn't like it and you know that's why you only you have creators turning over um, you know writer artist whatever you know like every five issues sometimes every three issues which you know if you want to keep people interested you got to have at least one thing that that keeps people that's the linchpin that keeps people coming back and when I was growing up you know uh, X-Men Chris Claremont the way he wrote you know it was a soap opera with superheroes and the way he did it though you were so invested in those characters because he wrote them so well but he was also very, very lucky that he had, you know, for his run anyway, the best artist in the business, you know? You go from Dave Cockrum, you know, um, John Byrne, Paul Smith, who was one of my favorite X-Men artists of all time. Um, you know, Ramita Jr. had a run on it. That's where I started collecting uh, X-Men, uh, was the cover of Wolverine standing over Kitty Pride's body. Um Mark Silvestri, I mean, whew, those issues were, were breathtaking. Um, Mark is a phenomenal artist, and I, I know a lot of it had to do with, like, the situation the X-Men were in at the time, but, man, he brought this grittiness and this... made it serious, you know? You made it so that you were like, oh they might not make it out of here, you know, because things were, were drawn in such a way that it, you know, there was threat implied and, and the situations that they were kind of stuck in was, you know, threat was implied. And then after, you know, Mark went on to Wolverine, you had Jim come on and then Jim went to regular X-Men, you know, Wills was doing X-Factor. Um, so, you know, you got to have that great linchpin and, and, if you can't keep an artist on for 10 years or whatever, which is impossible nowadays, um, at least make sure that the next guy is as good or better than the guy you just had. And modern comics just don't do that. They'll, they'll, you know, when I see like a vertigo style artist, you know, and I'm not slamming vertigo style, but sometimes a style fits a book. That's, that's just the way it is. That's just, it's fact, but you put a Vertigo artist on, like, Spider-Man, you know, or Captain America, and it's just like, what's going on, you know, this, this isn't fun anymore, this is weird, you know, and it's just, you know, if, if you're gonna draw that way, you have to kind of understand that, you know, that you're gonna be kind of in a box if you want to be popular at something, you know, I mean, one of the few people that got lucky was, like, Chris Bocciolo, you know, was, you know, drew death and, and Vertigo stuff. And then he went on to, uh, what was it, Generation X or something like that, you know, and is now a regular, you know, normal superhero artist. But that's rare, you know. You, you can't, you know, like, everyone at Marvel right now wants to draw, like... Um, uh, Stuart Amonin, and there is only one Stuart Amonin, and that guy is amazing. You know, you you look at the book he did with uh, Kurt Busiek for Superman, and then you look at the next thing he did, and it does not look like the same guy drew it. You know, I I'm a big fan of the kind of stuff that um um he did with uh, Mark Millar with Empress. That was really great. I loved it. Same thing with Reborn and Greg Capullo. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of Frank Quietly, but I loved uh, Jupiter's Legacy. I, I thought it was great, but I won't pick up anything else that he does because I just, it's got to be, it's like, like everyone went gaga for Joe Mad in the 90s, and I'm like, ugh. But when he did Battle Chasers, I was like, okay, I get it. But I'm only going to get it if he does you know, battle chasers, because that's the only thing that his stuff, to me, looks appealing, because it kind of fit that. I don't want to see him drawing X-Men, but that's just me. I'm an old fart. Um, 
but yeah, you know, there's there's a place for everybody. You just have to understand that um, not everybody's going to be uh, um, head over heels for for every style, you know. And uh, a lot of the times, the the styles that the the majority of the public like are are not these weird niche styles, you know. And it's just how it is. Um, you know, I'm I'm fans of artists that you know I don't I agree with them politically or or religiously or or whatever, and that has nothing absolutely nothing to do with my enjoyment of their art absolutely nothing my beliefs are mine their beliefs are theirs as long as they don't come to my house and, and try to hit me over the head with a frying pan telling me that I'm you know I'm living my life wrong I don't care because it doesn't affect me what affects me with said creator is you know what's the next coolest thing that they're doing that's all I care about this um, war that you know, everyone's kind of talking about with, uh, you know, people, oh, you can't vote a certain way, or you can't think a certain way, or, you know, that's kind of, you know, a lot of people who consider themselves, you know, social justice warriors, you know, they think they're doing good, but they're taking it way too far. And I am not a Republican by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm also not a Hillary fan. So I was kind of stuck for, for last election. Um, but I don't care. I don't care who voted for, for Trump. I don't care who voted for Hillary. I know I wasn't going to. And that's all that really matters to me is what are my convictions? What are my beliefs, and then I live them that way. I don't force my beliefs on people. I don't go around saying, oh, you voted for Trump, you must be a horrible, evil person. No, because I know a lot of people that voted for Trump, and, and I've got family that voted for Trump, and, you know, I'm not going to disown them because they voted for somebody I dislike or because, or somebody that the public dislikes. It It's not a big deal. It's It's choice. And that's you know, in that aspect of things, that's kind of what America's about, is you're supposed to have the freedom of choice without fear of repercussions. And, uh, I think we've forgotten that. I think people, uh, think they can bully their way and say, oh, well, if you're not going to follow our mental path, we're going to, we're going to ruin your life. We're going to get you fired from a job. We're going to call you a racist. You know, I've been called a racist, and I'm just like, are, are you fucking kidding me? They're like, oh, well, you're friends with Trump supporters. I'm like, so? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it is so, the world has become so kindergarten, and I just can't, ugh. That's why when, like, drama and shit happens on, on Facebook or Twitter, I'm just like, really? You know, you're not helping, you're not making it better, you're, you're just kind of feeding into it and you're not you're not making it go away and and social media I mean it's great but it's also been a bane for this uh, this generation I mean it, you can't do anything in this world without somebody pointing a finger and trying to you know get you thrown in jail or something for something so stupid you know uh, I'm, I'm an old fart. I'll I'll say it. Back in my day, you had a problem with somebody, you fucking duked it out. You know, if you had a problem with somebody, you know, you kick their ass. You kick their ass. If you got your ass kicked, you got your ass kicked. But you know, usually after that, the the problem went away. I don't know. I fear for the world, but all I worry about is my family and my sanity you know if, if I can't if I can't make money from from art because the industry collapses I'm still gonna do it 
you know, just because I can't make money from it, I'm uh, still going to do it, because it's who I am, it's, it's ingrained in me, you know, more than anything else in my life, um, you know, comics are my religion, uh, and that's, that's, that's true, I mean, it's, comics helped me learn how to read, taught me words that most kids that were my age at the time didn't understand, and I would go and find out what they meant, taught me how to enunciate, and taught me grammatical pause, so when I would read in social studies or whatever, and you know, the jocks that used to kick my ass for liking comics and being a nerd, being a fat nerd, you know, and they're all like, uh, but, 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 uh, 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 you know, you kind of got that little silent win of, ha ha, I'm not a dumbass, um, you know, com comics are not just throwaway pop culture, they're, they mean stuff to people, means, means something to me, uh, means something to my kids, my kids are ravenous for comics, they love comics, um, you know, my daughter loves all the, the Aspen stuff, um, and then I get her into some, some independent stuff that, that I come across from time to time, my wife loves, you know, comics, she'll, you know, I got her hooked on, like, Monstrous, and, uh, Sex Criminals, and, you know, kind of stuff that I would think, you know, she's not really a, a spandex kind of girl, um, but I think this stuff would interest her because, you know, she's a, she's a very avid reader, and she loves horror and creepy stuff, and, uh, so I try to find stuff that would appeal to her, and, uh, you know, my boys, my, my youngest is, you know, he's young, so of course he's, you know, all about Spongebob comics and Adventure Time and stuff like that, and my older boy is... You know, he'll see me read something, he'll be like, what you reading, Daddy? And I'll have to kind of think, is he old enough to handle this? And then I think, well, nobody was asking me that question uh, when I was a young kid. I just read whatever I could buy, and nobody really cared. But, you know, he, he loves whatever he can get his, get his hands on. Um, but, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm rambling. It's my first uh, real big video, um, I'm going to probably stop it right there, um, because I'm just going to ramble more and make more of an ass of myself, uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed, I hope you guys dig what I'm doing here, and, uh, I hope you'll be back for more, so, thanks a lot.